Um, and with that, we'll kick things off with tonight's speaker. So as I said, some of you have uh, met Dr. Rogi already, but for those of you who haven't, I'm happy to have her with us this evening. Um, she is the Andrew W. Mellon Research Scientist at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and the Manil Collection. She earned a Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry from Bryn Mawr College, a PhD in Chemistry from Yale University, and has held postdoctoral positions at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the University of Texas Health Sciences Center here in Houston. Before joining the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, she held positions as the Vice Instructor of Chemistry at Rice and the Andrew W. Mellon Assistant Professor in Conservation Science, and Science in the Department of Art Conservation at State University of New York Buffalo State College. She's the Vice President and Fellow of the American Institute for Conservation and an Associate Editor for the Journal of the American Institute for Conservation. And we are very happy to have her with us tonight. So Dr. Karina Rogi, uh, please take it away. I will okay. ask everyone to please mute their mics and then we will have a question and answer period following the session. Okay, hopefully you see that full screen, yes? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, so today I'm going to talk to you about probably one of the more interesting projects that I've been involved in, and this is a collaboration with a fellow scientist of mine at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and a kind of an example where two heads are better than one, and it took us both to figure out this project. So conservation science is kind of a weird thing, and so I thought to begin with I'd talk a little bit about what it is. I'm a chemist by training, and like anybody in an academic position, I do a lot of different things. So in the museum, I work with our conservators to advise them on how to treat our artworks. I do technical studies, which is looking at how an artwork was made or how a given artist worked. Um, I write a lot, sometimes too much. I try to um, create guidelines that will help preserve the works of art. I do service for the field. I work with our learning and interpretation department. I do fun things like go around the world with instrumentation and work on dig sites, and then also advise the museum on acquisitions. So it's, it's a multifaceted job, but at its heart, it's kind of basically forensics, but for art, not for dead bodies or art, automobile paint. And I'm glad I don't have to testify at trials. So like I said, one of the things that I do in the museum is advise on acquisitions, because if we're going to be spending millions of dollars on an object, we want to know that it is what it should be. And so we have to use um, all the things we have available, the techniques we have available to answer those questions. And the reason that we're able to answer them is because technology has changed over time, resulting in changes in materials. And so um, many types of pigments and binders have what we call born on dates. So they were invented in, at this time period, they were patented, they were manufactured, and that allows us to create chronologies of use. So for instance, white pigments. We have four main white pigments that were in use throughout history with some oddities thrown in now and then. The first one is uh, calcite calcium carbonate, and this was used since in antiquity. It was one of the primary white pigments used by the ancient Egyptians. So these tomb paintings from 1200, 1300 BCE, perfectly fine to find calcium carbonate. Uh, lead white, uh, lead, basic lead carbonate was an invented pigment. So it's synthesized from lead sheets by exposing them to acidic, um, acidic vapors. And it was invented by, or discovered by the Romans. And so we would expect to find it in Greco-Roman period types of objects. This is um, the gentleman there in the portrait is a, a Romano-Egyptian mummy mask. And he has lead white on him, perfectly legit, but it wouldn't have been for the earlier Egyptian artwork. And then it's in use up until even modern day. So it's the, it's the beautiful whites of Rembrandt's lace collars. Zinc white was introduced in the 1800s, first as a watercolor pigment and then as a pigment in oils. And so again, totally legit and used heavily by Piet Mondrian. So this work is from 37 to 42. He worked on it over a period of time. And then the last major white pigment to be invented was titanium white, which came in in the 1910s to 1920s and occurs in this Helioidesica painting from 1958. And so using this type of chronology, we can begin to parse out whether things are 
what they should be or not. So this is a mommy portrait from the Manil collection, and it had been considered suspect on stylistic grounds, but when I took a sample, and that's what you're seeing in the little inset up above, you can see the wood substrate, and then there's the greenish ground or preparatory layer, and then kind of the pinky gray surface layer. Um, that ground and paint both have zinc white in them and barium sulfate. And so zinc white says it has to be after 1830s. That means it can't be 100 CE to 300 CE, which was the purported date of the object. It's entirely a forgery. And the same kind of thing goes for this fake Francisco Zuberon painting. The ground or preparatory layer was found to have titanium white in it. So entirely a forgery. Now we can find modern paints on authentic objects because of restoration or conservation efforts, but in this case the entire ground is modern and we know the object isn't real. Things get a lot trickier when we get to modern art. So there are a lot of there's a lot of interest in forging these because they are highly valued, they're very saleable, and they can be harder to detect because while an authentic Robert Motherwell and Jackson Pollock painting, would ex you'd expect them to have titanium whites in them, so would modern forged paintings because it's really easy to get titanium white and basically you have a choice of titanium white or zinc white, it's just there, right? There doesn't have to be an effort on the part of the forger to try to use a pigment that would have been used by the artist. It's in, you know, Texas art supply. So it's, it's a big problem to try to sort out these modern forgeries. But we have some luck because titanium white underwent several um, changes in manufacturing practice over its time, uh, over the time of use. So the first form that was introduced in 1916 was the anatase polymorph. And the rutile polymorph, which has a higher covering color and is more stable, was introduced only later in 1941. Oops. And then it turns out there were even more complications in processing. So the very first forms of these pigments that were made weren't the pure anatase or the pure rutile. Instead, they were co-precipitated onto either barium sulfate or calcium sulfate. So basically the, the pigment manufacturers would take ilmenite ore, this iron titanium ore, they dissolve it up in sulfuric acid, they dissolve up barium sulfate or calcium sulfate in sulfuric acid, they would mix them together and co-precipitate them out until you get this composite or co-precipitate pigment. And with that, we have additional dates. So it turns out that the 1916 date was when the anatase barium sulfate was co-precipitate was introduced. And that was then added to with the calcium sulfate co-precipitate in 1925. And then finally, the pure anatase by itself, not co-precipitated on anything, was available by 1928. And a similar, Brutile went through a similar um, evolution. So the very first form of the rutile pigment introduced was um, the barium sulfate coprecipitate in the 40s. Then the, the barium sulfate quickly gets phased out. Pure rutile comes in in 57. And then the rutile calcium sulfate gets phased out sometime around 1980. We're not sure exactly when. So now all of a sudden we've got this much finer division of when certain pigments were introduced and available. And so, and you know, I've been asked to look at a painting that was purported to be from 1913 actually, and it had titanium white in it, which is really, really early. It was from Europe, so maybe because some of the Norwegian pigment manufacturers were making it then, but not very many, but it had no barium. So it absolutely could not be from 1913. So the question then becomes, how do we parse that information out? And we need to detect both the titanium, the polymorph of the titanium, and the sulfate. And so Raman spectroscopy seems to be a really good tool for that job. So I have no idea what y'all's background is. And so I'm used to talking to conservators. So if you know what Raman spectroscopy is, turn away and like multitask or eat your dinner. And if you don't, here's a very, very brief and very simplified introduction which is basically in Raman, your incoming laser light comes in and excites your molecule up into these virtual energy states. And very quickly then they decay 
emitting radiation of their own to an excited state. And that difference between the incoming laser beam and the emitted light gives you the Raman shift. And that's what we're measuring. So annotase and retile have lovely Raman spectra. They have, um, they're really easy to detect. They can be detected in low levels and they're a delight to anybody who just wants to run some pretty Raman. So the annotase has really a really strong peak at 143 and then some smaller lattice vibrations, whereas it's the lattice vibrations and rutile that are very strong. So they're absolutely distinguishable, very clean, very nice, very easy. And the sulfates are also very easily detected. So anhydrite and barium sulfate also give nice clear peaks by Raman spectroscopy. So it seems like that would be the tool for the job. But now I have to quote one of my favorite authors, which is that there is a fly in that unsullied ointment. Because pigment manufacturers are cheap. And they like to add materials to pigments that extend them, so extenders or fillers, something that will bulk up the pigment or the paint and yet not cost a lot of money. And sulfates are common additives as fillers, extenders. So in titanium pigments, you get them either through wet blending, which is where you mush them all up into water and then mix them together that way, or you get them through dry blending, which is kind of effectively just sieving them together. So how do we, you know, it seems like there's a lot of information there then that could come from knowing whether something is a co-precipitate or not, but you can't easily tell whether it's a co-precipitate or just a blended pigment. And so there's a lot of information that was just lost to the field. We couldn't refine it. And that's where Franz Klein, an abstract expressionist artist, comes in. So one of the very first projects I was tasked with at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston was looking at this painting, Wotan, um, because of its condition issues. And I took samples from it and encountered things I didn't understand. And simultaneously, my colleague Julie at the Met was looking at another Franz Klein painting and encountering things she didn't understand. And this is what we didn't understand. So this is a Raman spectrum from Wotan. And we quite clearly have rutile here. There's barium sulfate, there's calcium sulfate anhydrite, but then we've got these peaks here. And the fact that we were both seeing the same peaks said that it wasn't an artifact of the instrument because we were using different Raman systems. I was using a Renaissance, she was using a Bruker. And they're there. Why are they there? We don't know. And so that launched a really intensive search through the literature, trying to find other mentions by people of, who have seen these peaks because they're not an artifact. Somebody else has to have seen them. And Julie found this master's thesis by a student at Rutgers who was looking at pigments. And she showed a spectrum that looked really like ours. So she thought that they were fluorescence peaks, not Raman peaks. And she suggested that they were they came from iron that was trapped in the titanium dioxide matrix, something like corundum, like um, chromium and corundum. And so chromium and corundum is a transition that happens, that's an allowed transition to either of two different energy levels, non-radiative um, non decay, and then finally luminescence, which is fine, right? I mean, that's exactly how it works in corundum, but, the inorganic chemist of my origins was unhappy with this explanation. It did not make sense to me. So I went and I pulled out the inorganic chemistry text I had used as an undergrad and put, tried to like fit my inorganic chemistry hat back on and figure out whether her explanation made sense. So here's went back to the Tanabe Sugano diagrams. Here's the, the Sugano diagram for D5s, so um, iron three plus, and there's actually paper reporting on the um, field parameters in annotase, and that gives me an idea where it falls on the x-axis, and there are no allowed transitions. 
So not quite like chromium and corundum. The iron plus two, there weren't any um, papers that I could find that gave the field parameters. So I have to kind of estimate and hand waving a lot. I decided it was probably going to be a high spin situation. And I would kind of, again, loosely wave my hand around and say that the field parameters were gonna be somewhat akin to water. That's a big if. Here, the allowed transition is the first transition. It's the lowest energy and it doesn't correspond to the energies that we see by Raman spectroscopy. So it didn't seem like it was quite the same case as chromium and corundum. Now, iron species are often colored because you get um, ligand field energy, you know, charge transfers, you get um, iron-iron coupling. And so maybe what I was seeing was some kind of a resonance phenomena where we're, the laser's exciting into a band and we're seeing something kind of odd that way. Um, but when you look at the spectra collected with different lasers, so 633, 514, and you look at where those lasers, laser energies are on common absorption spectra of iron species, and I've included a 1064 band in here because there are, there's no, um, those peaks don't occur at 1064 either. You know, those lasers are not exciting into the predominant absorption bands. So it doesn't seem likely that it's a resonance effect either. So pretty much at that point, I was satisfied with my, you know, in my own understanding that whatever was going on, it wasn't due to iron coming along for the ride in the titanium dioxide. But, and doing all of this, I started thinking about luminescence. And iron can substitute into um, things and it will give you luminescence spectra, but the bands are really wide. So this is, you know, the, the bands here are like 200 nanometers and the bands I'm seeing in the Raman spectra are much narrower. So it just isn't right for iron. And here I wanna backtrack a little bit and talk about differences in luminescence and Raman scattering. So in Raman scattering, again, we have to use a laser, we push the molecules up into these excited states, they emit energy back down, and the energy of the light emitted is laser dependent, but the Raman shift is not, right? We're measuring the difference between the incoming laser beam and the outgoing energy, and we're only looking at that difference. With luminescence, energy comes in, there's non-radiative decay, and then light is emitted. And the energy of the light emitted is not laser dependent as long as the laser is um, of sufficient energy to bump the molecule up into its excited states. So in one case, Raman scattering, the energy of the light is laser dependent. In luminescence, it's not. In Raman scattering, the Raman shift is constant no matter what laser you use. But in luminescence, the apparent Raman shift changes with the laser. So here is the spectrum of our unknown material with the 785 nanometer laser. Here it is with the 633 nanometer red laser. And here it is with the 532 nanometer green laser. Here are our rutile peaks, they are constant doesn't depend upon the laser. Here's the calcium sulfate peak. It does not depend upon the laser, but our peaks change with the laser. And that's an indication that they are luminescence peaks, not proper Raman peaks. And we can show that, so they are laser dependent. We can show that by converting the Raman shift into wavelength and energies. And so here, the apparent wave number of the um, Raman peak shifts but our unknown peaks are energy independent. And so that indicates that they definitely are luminescence peaks. So one part of the salt problem solved, which we thought was pretty cool. So, yay, luminescence peaks. And then the question became, where did they come from? And anytime you get luminescence with particularly narrow energy bands, you have to think of the rare earth elements because those are uh, ridiculously luminescent and often have very narrow bands. And that's of course because of their lovely 4F orbitals. Um, 
europium has like 3000 energy levels. And so that's a lot of energy levels and that's a lot of possible transitions and that's a lot of possible bands. So the question then became, can we link our observed luminescence peaks to rare earth elements? And so I took samples from a titanium white pigment paint that had known luminescence and then samples from four paintings that displayed the luminescence, one of them being the Franz Klein painting, and sent them off for ICPMS analysis at the University of Houston. And here are the concentrations of the rare earth elements in those samples. So the Grumbacher titanium white and yellow is our non-luminescent material. Everything else is luminescent. And you can see that we've got relatively high concentrations of lanthanum, cerium, and neodymium. Lanthanum has, it's the oddity in the rare earths, it has no luminescence because it has no 4F electrons. Cerium will display luminescence, but the energies are wrong. They're lower than the energies that we see. Whereas neodymium, as you know, the story of the three little bears says, just right. The energies that neodymium gives in different minerals is right on par with what we're seeing. So that became our, our suspect of interest. And here are, you know, I started trolling through a lot of geological um, research. And so here are different rare earths substituted naturally into titanite. And you can see that the neodymium over here is within the correct energy bands for what we're seeing, whereas other things are not. And chromium gives this broad peak rather than the sharp, narrow peaks that are almost Raman-like, which are what the rare earths give us. And here's another case. Here's neodymium doped into titanium nanoparticles. And right at that 900 wavelength, that's exactly where we're seeing our peaks. So we were pretty sure that what we were seeing was this neodymium 4F 3 halves to 4 I 9 halves. So then the question became, where does this neodymium come from? And the answer to that turned out to be the ilmenite ore that was used to make the titanium, part, the titanium pigments. So titanium, um, ilmenite's not common everywhere, and it was the first source used by titanium pigment manufacturers. And in the whole world, there were two great localities that were being used for pigments when, you, when titanium pigments first became made. And that included the McIntyre mine in upstate New York, for the US suppliers of titanium pigments. And then the source in Ergesund, Norway for the, titan the Kronos titanovit pigments that were coming out of Norway. So I got samples of ilmenite from both of those localities. And then two additional samples from different localities, one from pretty close to the McIntyre mine coming from Ontario, and then one from the Middle Atlas Mountains in Morocco. And here are the neodymium concentrations. So Morocco and Norway have very, very, very low amounts of neodymium. New York, the McIntyre mine, has very high amounts of neodymium. And can the Canadian source is lower, but still higher than Norway or Morocco. It's um, geologically kin to the McIntyre mine source. Now the McIntyre mine was where Titanox pigments Pigment Corporation founded its refinery and it's abandoned now. I would someday love to go hike back into the Adirondacks and see it, but I have not yet. But that's that was where they mine their source. And they were uh, very nicely for everybody interested in titanium pigments. They published man this handbook. They called it the handbook, which outlined how they made titanium pigments their source of titanium pigments, the qualities of the different types of pigments they made, their hiding power, their chalking power, all of this kind of wonderful information that is invaluable when you go back and are trying to figure out what's going on. So I really just had to get some samples of titanium pigments, Titanox titanium pigments. And I did that by begging, pleading, and groveling with a colleague who was working at Yale at the time and he had a historic pigment collection that had been amassed by his mentor in the field and that he had inherited. And he had a whole raft of titanium titanox pigments 
And they were all in their original packaging. They all had the descriptive information. We could correlate the descriptive information from the packaging with what the handbook said. And it turns out that everything was correct. So Titanox A is supposed to be anatase treated with alumina. Raman says that it's anatase. You know, Titanox RA is supposed to be rutile. We see rutile. Um, Titanox C is a coprecipitate. We see rutile and calcium sulfate. And we see luminescence in the rutile pigments that are precipitated on calcium sulfate, which makes sense because that's what we were seeing with the samples from the Franz Klein paintings. They were rutile, they had calcium sulfate, they were luminescent. So we ran ICPMS on samples of the pigments and the pigments that don't display the luminescence the pure anatase and the pure rutile have really low concentrations of neodymium. The coprecipitated pigment that has a luminescence has high concentrations of neodymium, as does the ilmenite ore. And then the painting average is lower, but the painting average is, a, it's a, the samples are, have binder in them as well as the pigment. And so this, the ratios are slightly skewed. So I'm not worried about that difference in concentration. So it definitely seems like there's a link. Neodymium comes from the ilmenite ore. The neodymium is present in the Titanox pigments, which are using the high um, neodymium ore as their source. And then that gets incorporated into our, our paintings. And so, yay, luminescence. But there was one last piece of the puzzle. So luminescence from neodymium, neodymium from the ilmenite, coprecipitated only. So here's our sample from Wotan again. We see rutile peaks. The calcium sulfate peak is really beansy here, but it's there. And then we see our luminescence peaks. Well, as I analyzed more works of art, this is what I saw. It's anatase, clearly with the high intense 143 um, peak, but the luminescence peaks are the same as they are in the rutile. Now, rare earth elements, the four F electrons are shielded from ligand effects because of how close they lie to the nucleus. And so you can get very closely related species like this, um, these calcium and molybdate and tungstate species that show nearly identical luminescence. So this is the neodymium luminescence in those two species, right? Those spectra are really, really close. If you get something that's very different, then obviously your neodymium concentration or your neodymium luminescence peaks change. Rutile and anatase are similar, but they are not identical in terms of their um, bond angles and bond distances. So it seemed unlikely to me that there would be zero difference in luminescence if the neodymium was substituting in for the titanium. And it turns out that's because the neodymium isn't in the titanium dioxide, it's in the sulfate. And that makes sense if you stop and again, go back to your introductory inorganic chemistry text and think about Goldschmidt's rules for substitution, which say that higher charges always substitute for lower charges. So neodymium would prefer to substitute for calcium rather than for titanium, higher substituting for lower, and that there is a massive penalty for more than a 15% size difference. Neodymium is practically the same size as calcium. There's virtually no penalty for substitution there, whereas there would be a much larger penalty for substitution with titanium. The size alignment isn't as good with the barium, but again, you've got high substituting for low, so it will substitute. And so the end of this, where this comes from, is that the neodymium comes from the ilmenite ore, that it gets dissolved up in acid the same as the titanium, and that during the precipitation with the sulfate, it substitutes in for the calcium or barium and tags along for the ride in the co-precipitated pigments. And this then explains why we see the luminescence only in co-precipitated species. 
not in the pure anatase or the pure rutile. And so now we have this luminescent marker that tells us whether a pigment is co-precipitated or not, and therefore gives us dating information. It also tells us about whether it's a US made pigment or not, because if we see that luminescence, it pretty much has to be a Titanox pigment. It's not going to be a Norwegian Kronos Titanovet pigment because there wasn't neodymium in those ores. So we've got locality information and some dating information out of it, and that's pretty cool. But then the question becomes, does this actually pan out in reality, right? Can, does what we think it mean translate into useful information from works of art? So, 108 paintings from the MFH and the Manila collections made in the US. They date from between 1926, so the earliest painting I sampled was this Everett G. Jackson from 1926. The latest one I sampled, and one of my personal favorites, was this Melissa Miller painting from 1983. And the paintings are pretty you know, evenly distributed over that time range with a slight cluster kind of mid-century. So I can now hopefully figure out what the white pigments are in all of those paintings and test the, the ideal timeline against what the, we actually see. So there are paintings that contain lead white, which is for my use here, not of interest um, because it was in use since antiquity. We do see zinc white in some, which we would expect. I don't see any of the anatase barium sulfate coprecipitate. It was never a very popular pigment, and so it wasn't in use for very long, and I'm not particularly worried about that. But here's our anatase calcium sulfate. The first occurrence is actually pretty late, and whereas it was introduced much earlier. And it continues actually surprisingly late. I would have thought that it would have been phased out in the 50s when rutile really took over the, the titanium world. Here's pure anatase itself. It corresponds pretty well with the manufacturing dates. Here's the rutile calcium sulfate. Its first use is in 1945, very soon after it was introduced. And the last one is really late. It's at like 1977. So it was actually it continued on for a while. And then I don't see the barium sulfate with the rutile. And then here's rutile itself. And so when we compare the survey range of the paintings to our known manufacturing dates, and when we actually see the paintings, there's a really good correspondence. So the anatase calcium sulfate begins, begins being manufactured in 1916. We see it later, but it continues up through almost 1970. The rutile calcium sulfate was first manufactured in 41. We see it pretty early on, and it continues until about when we thought it was going to phase out in 1980. So now all of a sudden we've got something that really does allow us to parse very finely the dates for titanium pigments made in the US. It's also of use because its detection limits are super low. So the luminescence, in, no matter the laser that is used, is always at least as intense as the rutile peaks. And the pigment itself is 30% rutile, and we know from the ICPMS it's 0.001% neodymium. And so it's much more sensitive for neodymium. And the detection limit for rutile in clay is you know, not very good, it's 0.09%, but the, ne the neodymium luminescence is so much more intense, it can be a diluted 333-fold, and we would still see it. And so that's enough to you know, be a pure titanium white paint and a titanium white paint mixed with something else. And so we're gonna see it even in mixed paints and that provides us with more information. So we like that. And these are the range of paintings that I have found it in. So Franz Klein's, Jackson Pollock's, um, a Grandma Moses painting, we had one, it happened to have it, and a lot of other Abex painters. So Hans Hoffman, Robert Rauschenberg, it's in an Andy Warhol, uh, it's in a Texas painter, Dorothy Hood, so it occurs in a lot of um, artists that are of interest to art historians and scholars. It's also of interest because now it allows us to parse out modern forgeries. So a painting made post you know, 1980 onward, 
will not have the co-precipitated pigments in it because you just can't find them. It was really hard for me to get historic examples of it. Forgers aren't going to know that. They're going to go out and they're going to buy a titanium white pigment. It will be modern. It won't be a co-precipitate. It won't have the luminescence. But if a painting was purported to be made in the 1950s and it has the luminescence, then it's consistent with those older types of pigments. And that doesn't indicate that the artist who it's claimed to be by necessarily did it, but it indicates that the pigment is old. It's the old style of pigment. And so this becomes really key and um, will help solve things like the Nodler Gallery forgery, which is what I'm referring to here. And if you haven't watched it, you should definitely go watch the Netflix Made You Look special, which talks about it. So um, yeah, we hope that it will be taken of use and used by the FBI, used by the auction houses as a way to help add a little bit of clarity and science into the issue of dates of objects. It also might help us talk about whether a paint is an artist paint or a house paint. And this becomes of interest to a lot of art historians because we know that artists sometimes used it. And before I get up too far ahead, here's a, we know that um, different paint manufacturers changed which pigment they used. So Weber Power Malibu was the composite pigment until the new forms came in, and then they switched it to titanium dioxide, pure titanium dioxide, the rutile form. And I did a survey of artist paints from the National Gallery study collection, and none of the artist paints display the luminescence because they were using the more expensive, higher covering power, pure forms of anatase or rutile. And but the house paints continued to use it for a really long time because it was cheaper and it covered well enough for a house paint. So this is a recipe for a house paint from 1959. And it's talking about using this titanium calcium pigment, which is the co-precipitate. So it was used in house paints a lot longer than artist paints. And like I said, this is something of interest to art historians because you see pictures like this where Klein has a tube of high test zinc white paint, it turns out, sitting on his, his desk. But then he also has an open can of white paint behind him. Was this staged? Was he using both artist paints or house paints? Can we figure this out? Um, certain artists like Jackson Pollock are known to have used industrial paints, but a lot of mythology gets built up around other artists. What were they using? Klein theoretically used house paints early in his career and then in 1956, his gallerist yells at him basically and steals his paints and tells him only to use artist paints. Did that really happen? Was this a myth? Um, did he continue to use house paints throughout the rest of his career? Or um, Barnett Newman was an artist who supposedly only ever used artist paints. He was supposedly very careful about his materials. And yet we find this co-precipitated pigment in some of his paintings. And so was he saying something that wasn't actually true? Was he willing to use a cheaper house paint for his white grounds and then used artist paints, which would be um, possibly more stable for his colored areas? So it's a, a way to interrogate that way too. Caveats, the other issue, right? How, when does this luminescence fail us or does it? Anhydrite's a naturally occurring mineral. Neodymium, can occur naturally as well. And it turns out that in a few rare cases I've been able to find, you do see this luminescence in naturally occurring in hydrate. So this is a sample from um, a seafloor hydrothermal bed, not something that we're gonna encounter normally in the art world. So there are luminescence peaks there. But this is, um, these were luminescence peaks that were seen on this pre-Roman piece of pottery. And I think they are luminescence from anhydrite, neodymium in anhydrite, although it wasn't ever tested. So on a very rare occasion, you can see this naturally. It's not a 100% guarantee, it's a modern titanium pigment. And then here's some other weird luminescence on this uh, Della Robbia figure that is probably neodymium, but maybe not calcium sulfate anhydrite, but I haven't figured it out yet. So to be determined. So yes, you can see luminescence from other sources than these co-precipitated pigments, but it's pretty easy to sort out still. So I'm not too worried about its overall utility. So it's easy to detect. It's got um, a super high sensitivity level. 
it derives from the ilmenite ore and gets incorporated into the calcium sulfate or barium sulfate. It indicates this co-precipitated pigment. And now we've got added dating, refined dating information and refined provenance location for the paints. And all of that makes a pretty darn good tool for art historians and for conservation scientists. So um, I have to thank my co-author, Julie, because this did take two minds. Uh, Dr. Gao at the University of Houston ran the ICPMS for us and was super nice about it. Um, the Raman that I used is from Rice University and the Shared Equipment Authority. And then the curators and conservators at the MFH and the Manel Collection who allowed me to go around and take little teeny tiny samples of white paint from 108 paintings. So many people to thank. And I will leave you with one of my all time favorite cartoons and be happy to try and address any questions that you might have. Yeah, I'll pause a moment to read the comment. Thank you so much, Corey. That was fascinating. Um, if anyone in the audience has any questions, you can type them in chat or there's a few enough of us who can speak up and ask questions. And if not, maybe I'll kick off with one, which um, kind of going back to earlier on in the beginning when you're talking about all these different forms of paint and which paints they were in. And I guess in, in the case of the Titanox, they're kind enough to put together a handbook for you. But um, how do you get that information as to which companies were making which pigments at which time in particular, because not everyone is kind enough to put together an entirely correct, as it turns out, manual. They are not. It turns out that a lot of artist paint companies um, keep really stringent records. And if you're lucky, you can work out a relationship with the paint company and get access to the records. So like there's a group in the Netherlands who has gotten access to all of the records from um, the Rembrandt Paint Company. And so they're, you know, they've got color books, they've got test swatches, all of that, which is super rich. And the paint companies themselves don't have the time or the inclination necessarily to go do studies on them, but they also have no proprietary interest in keeping that information hidden per se. And so it becomes a lot of interrogation like that. We read a lot of patents, an awful lot of patents. And then also we're dependent kind of on colleagues being interested, you know, I don't have access to the Norwegian pigments, but maybe this work will spur somebody in Norway to look to see whether something can be done there. And so we, we spread out that way. And um, the conservation science world is super collaborative in that way. Excellent. Um, I do have a question from Carrie, and there are a couple of other people who are interested as well. How much material do you typically need to do an analysis? I imagine everyone's not thrilled if you were to go cut out a couple of square inches of every painting. So, for for Raman spectroscopy, if I can see the pigment particle, that's enough. Usually, I'm working with like a 50x, um, mag, you know, 50x through 50x optics. So, if it's visible to the naked eye, I can see it. So, I go in with little tiny tungsten needles or little tiny micro chisels and tease out the barest spec. And then um, ethically mandated by the field, I take the samples only from areas of extant damage so that luckily a lot of paintings uh, bear their age in their faces just like humans. And so I'm taking them from turnover edges where the canvas and the paint layers crack and I can just get in there and tease a little bit out and nobody even knows that it's gone. Um, some, some, things require larger samples. The ICPMS did. And so those were all taken from paintings where I could access the turnover edges of the painting. So the canvas comes along, it goes over the stretcher bars and turns. So I could take it from areas that nobody will ever see. And the curators were fine with that. And that's, oh, those were milligram size samples. So absolutely huge by my standards. I guess at that point, you're kind of hoping if you shake the painting lightly, a speck falls off the, <laughs> of the bit that's Volunteer relevant. samples. <laughs> and it does happen. So sometimes a painting gets shipped or another object gets shipped and bits fall off and you're like, yay, bits. Now I have another- the packaging materials. 
yeah. yeah. Corey, how much um, uh, does the um, representative uh, nature of the sample come in here? If you just get a one tiny little speck, how do you know that it's representative for the, uh, the painting as a whole? So one of the things that I always do when I'm taking samples is that I look at the painting or object really closely under both normal light and under UV light. And almost always that will illuminate areas of retouching. And those I then avoid because um, they're different paints, they're different pigments, they fluoresce differently. And I can pretty clearly see what's original versus what's a later intervention. So yeah, it is something that we have to be careful about. Are, are these pigments, these uh, forms stable over time? Um, mm -hmm. So exposure to, to sunlight, for instance, wouldn't change them? No, you get, so titanium pigments will um, chalk their binding media and because they're actually, they're photoreactive but they themselves don't really decay over time period. Unlike a lot of the organic pigments, which can be extremely uh, fugitive, light sensitive and fade over time. But the titaniums are pretty good. Um, other inorganic ones that we have to worry about include vermilion, which can blacken, Egyptian blue can discolor. Um, you know, you can get weird reactions with some of the sulfides, the cadmium sulfides or the chromates. Um, a lot of redox chemistry goes on in those cases. So like the conversion of cadmium sulfide to cadmium sulfate becomes a big problem, but titaniums are pretty good. Hey, Corey, I have one question. Uh, so it seems like you lucked out in knowing someone who had a stockpile of these pigments. Like how common is it for people to just have these things lying around and um, and if you didn't have access to that, you know, how would things have turned out differently? So the field, conservation science, one of the first big conservation scientists who really brought the field to national attention was Robert Feller. And he was the person who collected these pigments. And there are storehouses of historic pigments and historic paints that are kept at different localities. So Harvard has um, the Forbes collection, which was a, a huge sample, but there are subsamples of the Forbes around. And actually the Forbes in Harvard had some of the titanium pigments, the Titanox pigments, but they were in such small amounts they were not willing to share, which is absolutely fine. The National Gallery has a whole set of historic paints that they keep. The Getty has a whole set of historic paints. Um, we kind of all agglomerate our own sets at different institutions. And then the question just becomes, how do we get the word out that we have them? And there's a push to kind of create this um, international database of uh, known historic materials, particularly paints and pigments. And it hasn't actually been launched yet, but otherwise it's word of mouth. There's a, um, the American Institute for Conservation and the International Council of Museums Conservation Group have listservs and people will post on there sometimes saying, you know, I'm looking for a historic sample of this. Does anybody happen to have one? And oftentimes if people do, they'll, they'll shout out and say, I do, and I'll send you a, you know, a couple of grains of the pigment. So it's, um, we, the field learned early, early on that having these reference materials was really important. And we're really indebted to those people who started those collections because then they've just grown since then. Cool. And if I hadn't, if I hadn't had the Titanox pigments, um, I think I still would have gotten to the same conclusion. It would have taken me longer and I might be less secure, but the energy ranges were definitely indica indicative of neodymium. I had the link to the ilmenite ore. And then because I had paint samples that had both anatase and rutile with the same luminescence peaks, that pretty much indicates that it's the sulfate. So it was nice to have the Titanox pigments, but I don't think it was absolutely critical to have the Titanox pigments. <laughs> 
shorten the timeline of the project significantly to yeah. have something to refer to for sure. Any other questions? I did have one, which is more of a subjective thing. I know you said that you, there were some paints that obviously people, you know, weren't used much. Um, do you have any ideas why that why that was, or is that just a case of you know a consumer product failing to find its market or not being up to the quality that it's the consumers required? Um, the the early titanium pigments were at least in the art community, not favored. There was doubt about them, a doubt about their stability. Uh, artists, particularly then, were concerned about long-term longe longevity. And the early ones were kind of grubby colored and they were pretty coarse and not nice in paints. And so why switch to this newfangled pigment when you have perfectly good zinc white and even better lead white? Like if you've ever painted with lead white paint, it's marvelous how it throw, flows off of the brush. And, you know, you want, you want that tactile loveliness of it and not the nastiness of the titanium. And then, yeah, it just became like what, what had the higher, higher hiding powder, what was power, what was more economical to produce, and the company has responded to that really quickly with those changes. So, this uh, would that tie into? I know this is uh, maybe not something that you'd see, but you know, we're talking about luminescence. Does the do the paints that have this particular neodymium concentration in them have a different actual appearance? Is this the case? I mean, you've seen some where it's like it turns out if you throw them under a UV light that's why they look brighter is because they have UV peaks that, that are showing up, but um, we, in this we, case. Yeah, we tried that. We tried um, illuminating them and then looking, you know, using a modified camera and using filters in front of the lens to try to detect, you know, using visible light, could we detect luminescence coming off? And we never, we never got it to work. I think it's, it's powerful by Raman standards, but it's not powerful by our eye standards. So the, the Raman detectors are just way more sensitive than, than we or the camera filter was, or the camera detector was. So much for the easy mode of just setting up a digital camera and taking a photo. <laughs> I know, it would have been really cool. There are some uses, so like um, zinc white has different uh, crystal, not, not polymorphs, but different crystalline, well, different particle forms, I want to say. And those do fluoresce differently. And so you can get some information about it that way. But the titanium under UV light, it just kind of gives this purplish fluorescence and it's not very useful. It doesn't matter the form or the, or the pigment. It's... Oh, well, sometimes you have to do the science. <laughs> yes, sometimes you do. Although you can do Raman in situ. So you, I can't because I'm using the Raman at Rice and I'm not going to haul a painting over there, but other museums have Raman systems that have fiber optic probes that go out and you can absolutely do it without taking a sample. And there are handheld Raman instruments too, although I don't, I don't know that their range would catch the luminescence peaks. They're more limited, right? If I hadn't had access to a set of different lasers and to an instrument that was willing to scan a really broad range, I wouldn't have been able to prove that it was luminescence. Mm -hmm. Now that you know what it is, maybe some of those could catch the very beginnings of the luminescence peaks. I guess it also is on the instrument manufacturers at that point in that if there was a demand for a handheld instrument that would go to that range, yeah. then they could potentially build something. But yeah. the number of people who are perhaps running around museums with a handheld Raman trying to identify fakes is smaller than the market. Yeah, and actually it was, I think it was only because I was using a Renishaw system that, I mean, these paints have been around. Many samples from paintings that have this material in it have been analyzed by many other people, but because of where the normal annotase and rutile peaks appear, nobody ever does a full length scan, right? They're only looking at an abbreviated range and why bother to do a long scan when you don't need it? There's no information out there. But I look at enough mixed samples where um, Prussian blue has uh, 
peaks out there that I just always habitually waste the time to do these full scans. And so I picked it up where many people probably would have missed it. If that's the hazard of looking for something that you know is there is you don't look for anything else <laughs> that might be there as well. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so miss, missing the forest for the trees sort of situation. Or, or just waving, you know, saying, I don't know what it is. I don't care, right? Um, that's not how I operate. It drives, drives me crazy when there's something there that I don't know what it is or why, it, why it's there. And so I'm not willing to let it rest. And in this case, at least it turned out to be useful. Justifies all the other times, right? <laughs> and the indulgence that your institution gives you to be like, I want to take samples from all those paintings and, you know, potentially waste my time. But it all turned out well in the end. It did. It did. And, and I haven't put my email address up here, but for anybody who has future questions or anybody who's watching the recording later, um, Dawn has my contact information. And so if you reach out to her, she'd be happy to give you my email address. Yeah, you can uh, look for ACS uh, Greater Houston section on the web, and that will take you to our website, which has different ways to contact us through our social media, through email, um, through the website there. And then we'd be happy to pass on any particular inquiries. So with that, if no one else has any additional questions, I would like everyone to join me in thanking Corey very much. This was a wonderful and fascinating seminar. Uh, I know I'll be looking at it again if anyone needs any tips for showing this to an inorganic chemistry lecture class, uh, Tanabe Sugano diagrams and all this sort of stuff. This is like relevant application of inorganic chemistry to your life. <laughs> so I hope everyone uh, had a wonderful evening and a wonderful chat. And thank you all for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you again at our next event. Thank you again, Corey. It's been a pleasure. Enjoy your evening. And thank you most, so much for inviting me. As I told my colleagues at the museum, finally, I get a chance to geek out and talk to my people. <laughs> I was very impressed with that email when I got it. It's like, oh, it's the American Chemical Society. I'm an inorganic chemist. These are my people. <laughs> they are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Corey. Thank you. We'll see you again soon. Hopefully. Come visit the museum. <laughs> yes, we will. <laughs>